Dr. NGR Educational and Research Institute, University, Madhurabol, Chennai. Dr. NGR Educational and Research Institute, University, Madhurabol, Chennai. Good evening to one and all. We are all gathered here at the national level webinar on nanobiomaterials in healthcare organized by Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Humanities and Science, face to campus of Dr. NGR Education and Research Institute, deemed to be University, Chennai. Tam in Buruvadu, Ulagin Purakandu, Kamuruvar Katrarindar. The learned will long for more learning when they see that while it gives pleasure to themselves, the world also derives pleasure from it. So we are all here to learn and share the pleasure. I'm Dr. L. Ramapriya, Assistant Professor in Department of Chemistry of Faculty of Humanities and Science at Dr. MJR Education and Research Institute. It's a great privilege to me to anchor today's program online. Joining with me in the studio are our Deputy Dean Academics, Dr. Aruna Chalam, Deputy Dean Administration, Mr. Sendhil Kumar, Head of the Department, Dr. S. Maliyamai, Mr. Sam Sasikala, Assistant Professor in Chemistry, Dr. R. Nitya, Assistant Professor in Chemistry, and um, Mr. Ganesh Babu, Technical Assistant from Computer Science Department. We also have our Speaker of the Day, Dr. T. M. Sridhar, Head in Charge of Analytical Chemistry Department in University of Madras, and Secretary of Society of Biomaterials and Artificial Organs, Trivanandapuram. Let us start this academic event with welcome under us. I invite Dr. S. Vadliyamai, Professor and Head, Department of Chemistry, to deliver the welcome under us. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon to one and all connected here. I express my heartfelt gratitude to our beloved Founder Chancellor, the ACS Shanbugam Sir, and our Honorable President, Engineer ACS Arun Kumar Sir, for encouraging and motivating us to conduct many number of online programs. I am also indebted to welcome our Vice Chancellor, Dr. S. Geda Lakshmi, our Register, our Provost, and other higher officials of our university. I am very much happy to welcome our Joint Register, Dr. S. Ramalingam, Dean Dr. S. Manivannan, who stands beside us in organizing fruitful events. I also take this opportunity to welcome our Deputy Dean, Academics, Dr. A. R. Arnachalam, and Deputy Dean, Administration, Mr. K. Sindhil Kumar, who are always on their heels and keen enough to support and encourage the staff for conducting valuable programs. We welcome you, sir. I feel immensely happy in welcoming our today's Chief Guest, Dr. T. M. Sridhar, Assistant Professor and Head in Charge, Department of Analytical Chemistry, University of Madras, Hindi Campus, Chennai. He is a person who has rich experience in teaching and research. I think today's topic, nanobiomaterials in healthcare is an apt one in this current scenario. I welcome you, sir. I also think that we'll be benefited in your valuable presentation today. A pleasant and a very warm welcome to all the participants without whom this program would have not become a successful one. I welcome all the participants on, the on behalf of the Department of Chemistry. I also welcome my department staff who are always beside me for the success of the department. I also take this opportunity to welcome and also to thank Mr. Ganesh Babu, who always rendered his helping hands in times of need to make this event successful one. And last but not the least, I also welcome my dear students who are utilizing this opportunity for their success. Thank you one and all. Thank you, Madam, for your welcome address. Now I request our Deputy Dean Phase 2, Academics Dr. A. R. Arunachalam, a dynamic and motivational speaker to render inaugural address. Yeah, so thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome, uh, on behalf of Dr. MGR Education Research Institute, Adelamo to Phase 2 campus. I once again welcome all the participants uh, as well as the speaker for uh, today's uh, national level webinar on uh, nano biomaterials in healthcare. So first of all, I wholeheartedly thank our Honorable uh, President Engineer A.C. Sarun Kumar, sir, uh, for always supporting us uh, towards conducting a lot of uh, various activities. And I think all the departments are doing extremely well, uh, conducting a lot of online activities uh, on uh, uh, recently uh, emerging uh, topics you know, uh, with regards to the 
particular uh, department, whether it's chemistry or physics or computer science or whatever. Now, there are a lot of emerging uh, topics. So I think departments are, are choosing uh, the emerging or maybe you call it as a recent uh, topics uh, and conducting a lot of uh, webinar workshops uh, so that it reaches uh, thousands of uh, people who belong to the academic uh, community. Uh, so to, I think I congratulate the chemistry department, uh, head of the department of Grace Valley, my ma'am, and as well as a team of faculty members, uh, uh, Dr. Amapriya ma'am and Nitya ma'am and as well as Sajikala ma'am who are doing a great job today uh, in coordinating this uh, national level webinar, uh, which is uh, going to reach a lot of people today. Uh, so really I, I appreciate them and congratulate them uh, for organizing this today's uh, uh, webinar on again uh, one more uh, recent uh, topic in the department of chemistry uh, so i really thank our uh, speaker of uh, today's uh, event dr tm sridhar uh, who's assistant professor and head of the department at uh, university of madras uh, uh, for accepting uh, our invitation uh, uh, to spend this valuable time with us uh, uh, to take this wonderful session so thank you so much sir uh, it's a great pleasure for all of us uh, to have you here uh, with this uh, today's online event. Uh, uh, so once again, I really uh, welcome all the other participants and I really appreciate the chemistry department uh, for organizing this uh, national level webinar. So thank you. Uh, the, I thank the department for giving me an opportunity to talk a few words uh, on uh, in today's event. Thank you. That's really a valuable appreciation and motivational to all of us, sir. Thank you for your appreciation. May I now request our Deputy Dean Phase 2 Administration, Mr. K. Sandhil Kumar, Active Administrator, to render felicitation address. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon and all. I am happy that I am here to give you a felicitation address. First, I thank our beloved President, Engineer S.S. Arun Kumar, for his motivation at all times. I appreciate the Department of Chemistry Phase 2 for bringing out a national webinar on an interesting topic, nanomaterials in healthcare. Medical field is a growing sector, and anything that fits into it to serve your patients towards their good health and well being is always considered a welcome move. I congratulate the resource person, Dr. T.M. Sridhar, assistant professor, and head department of analytical chemistry, University of Madras, for offering to speak on this timely topic. Thank you, sir. We welcome you. I am once appreciate the competent organizing team, Dr. Valiyamai, head of the department, and the rest of the staff members for their hard work to organize a webinar on this session. I welcome all beloved participants and hope you all will be a benefited a great extent through your participation in this program. Thank you and best wishes, everyone. Thank you for your warm and kind felicitation address, sir. Now let me invite Ms. M. Sasikala, Assistant Professor in Chemistry Department Phase 2 to introduce today's speaker. It is my great privilege to introduce our today's chief guest, Dr. T. M. Sridhar, Assistant Professor and Head in Charge for the Department of Analytical Chemistry, University of Madras. He has completed his M.E. in Biomedical Engineering from Vinayaka Mission University in the year 2012. Earlier, he obtained his master's degree from the Department of Analytical Chemistry in the year 1995 and also back university second rank holder. He was also awarded a PhD degree with the best PhD thesis award in the year 2001-2 by NIS International. Earlier, he also served as head Department of Chemistry Rajalakshmi Engineering College and also served as head for the Department of Biomedical Engineering Department at Satyabama University and SMK for Fombra Institute of Technology. He was awarded the Piwoski Balaki uh, Postdoctoral Fellow at the Faculty of Engineering, Tel Piwai University, Israel. He is currently the secretary for the Society for Biomaterials and Artificial Organs India. Also, Vice President for the Indian Society of Analytical Scientists Chennai Chapter and former Secretary for the NAS International India Section South Zone. He is an elected Fellow of Ac Academy of Sciences Chennai in the year 2019. He also awarded with NM Sampat Award in the year 2014 by the Electrochemical Society of India, IASC Campus Bangalore for the significant research contribution. 
emerge he also received emerging professional achievement award from asm international chennai chapter and also many more awards he has received 15 paper awards for his research presentations at various forums and also has published around 50 research papers in international journals with high impact factor and citations 26 papers in books and proceedings around 100 plus papers at international conferences and several at national conferences and also the member of many professional societies he has a citation index of around 1300 plus and h index of 10 it is our great pleasure to welcome you sir department of chemistry faculty of humanities and science dr m j r education and research institute takes pleasure in hosting this webinar before i hand over the platform to our today's resource person dr t m sridhar an announcement to all the participants i'm sure you will enjoy this speech and request you to post your queries in the chat box which will be answered at the end of the speech you can avail your participation certificate by submitting the feedback form which will be available only after the end of the session and active till 7 pm today your cooperation will be extremely appreciated till the end of this webinar now over to the speaker thank you madam sir you are online sridhar sir so i am thankful yes madam you are able to see the screen i have just shared my screen yes sir yes sir we can sir Okay. So I uh, I would like to place my uh, thanks on record to Dr. Valiyamai, the head of the Department of uh, Chemistry, and to Dr. Rama Priya, who have been constantly following it up with me in uh, organizing this uh, webinar and also the uh, how to do it and uh, things in uh, getting this organized. and i would also like to thank uh, the deputy deans uh, dr aruna chalam and uh, mr sendil kumar for uh, facilitating and being a part of this program so today i would like to start to you uh, about this topic which is on uh, nano biomaterials in uh, healthcare so so i am from the department of analytical chemistry university of uh, madras so this university is a 163 year old uh, university uh, which was established in 1857 and uh, my department was established way back in 1959 so we have completed uh, 60 years of our academic uh, excellence uh, the university is spread across uh, six campuses with uh, 73 plus academic departments uh, totally organized under 18 schools and uh, the honors also include uh, the alma mater of which uh, two indian physics are the physicist are the nobel laureates uh, five presidents of india including dr apj abdul kalam and several notable mathematicians including srinivas and ramanujam and uh, several other uh, personalities so uh, now i would like to tell you about uh, since this is organized for the chemistry department what is the role of uh, chemistry and uh, what chemistry has done for you so if you look at uh, uh, chemistry plays a vital role in all human beings uh, right from you start your day and you start keep moving on as it goes so if you look at what all you need in the day so you start your day with uh, uh, with washing your face with soap or brushing your teeth with a toothpaste so all these are synthetic materials and all of them be a part of our daily life so if you look at uh, the power you need for all your phones comes from mobile batteries which is nothing but lithium is the metal that is present in it and uh, to have a healthy growth of the plants so that they give us uh, good food so for that you need to use fertilizers and to move from place to place we need uh, automotives and to run those automotives we again need energy that is the fuels and uh, when it move to the medical field you always have to do a surgery Uh, you don't want a person to feel the pain so therefore you give him an anesthetics and also to cure a patient you need the drugs so all the drugs are chemical in nature and that comes under the category of antibiotics so from there to catalytic converters to water treatment to all these places you see chemistry is inseparable for any person so chemistry always travels with you wherever you are also 
traveling yes uh, now if you look at the role of uh, chemistry and uh, chemical engineering so chemistry is a course which always offers job opportunities for you so anywhere uh, in the world you go you will always be able to find a job so this is to give you the projections in uh, billion us dollars so if you look at which are all the sectors that are where maximum money has been invested the first field that outstands is pharmaceuticals and today you know in this corona period uh, what the world is looking from india the uh, world was able to give two drugs one is uh, remdesivir and the other one was the favipar so both these drugs are licensed for manufacturing in india and it is here where you can do the cost optimization so we did manufacture and of course that is now marketed across the world the next ma major game change in which the entire country and the government was involved was the development of vaccines so it is uh, india's only country in the developing countries if you look at who has a vaccine and now we produce our vaccine and we are able to uh, export it across the world and today you have all the countries are in queue to receive your vaccine so this was been possible or this was possible only because of the uh, role of the pharmaceutical industry and our uh, competence in this so pharmaceutical industry is always a major source of employment for all chemists so followed by this is your bulk petrochemicals and intermediates so which involves the manufacture of uh, right from fertilizer to fuel uh, whether it is diesel petrol all your refineries and then you get all your polymers everything the main source is petroleum and petroleum products so that is one of the main consumers followed by plastic uh, resins to inorganic chemicals and all these things including other specialties everything comes under the concept of uh, chemistry so having uh, studied chemistry it helps you in your daily day life and also it gives you very good and rich employment opportunities to give you a brief introduction about my department what we do in analytical chemistry is so normally when you take any substance you look at its properties physical and chemical if you take a perfume bottle yes it looks like a liquid that is stored in a glass container in a glass bottle but when you spray it it is converted into the aerosol so which it is converted uh, which goes and falls on your skin or falls on your clothes and then as you keep moving the smell attracts all the people to look at you so that's how you try to discover it and make it separate it into chemical and physical so once you know the chemical and physical properties you look at uh, the electrochemical whether it is radiation resistance or whether it is reactive then you make use of uh, radiation which is ionizing as well as non ionizing so you can make use of all this class of instruments and finally what you try to do is you try to separate a compound identify it and then you try to make the measurement so this is how the cycle keeps going on and this is all about analytical chemistry so basically we make use of three different methods one is uh, chemical analysis the other one is structural analysis and the one is the physical properties so how do you divide this this can be divided into two types one is the instrumental methods and the other one is the chemical methods chemical methods is classically what you have been doing right from your school days where you do the titration gravimetry as well as the solution chemistry but as when it comes to the instrumentation methods it is all about uh, your instruments so accuracy is high error levels are very low and therefore you make use of spectroscopy so right from uh, nmr to optical absorption that is your uv visible all this uh, come under this category then microwave then optical emission so all this can be studied using spectroscopy on the other side when you want to find out what is the molecular weight and uh, based on the molecular weight you want to find out what is happening so then we go to mass spectroscopy so mass spectroscopy in this you have the uh, tof time of flight sims quadrupole so these are all the different techniques in mass uh, spectroscopy itself so therefore all these things play a big role and this is about the analytical chemistry so if you look at it, it can be just uh, put on into a single chart where you look at uh, you have this scale in armstrong and here it is in centimeters so from centimeters you come to millimeters and then you come to micrometers and then you come to armstrong level and this is the detection range from 10 p uh, parts per trillion to uh, 1 ppm parts per million so all your techniques which you have is just listed down over here 
so whether it is uh, raman or uh, atomic emission spectroscopy or your uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy or your atomic force microscopy so all this can be fit in over here and any size of sample you give a chemist will be able to tell you what it is and of course this is the basis of the instrumentation where you always have the detected emission as well as the primary uh, excitation so optical means you make use of light all these techniques come under uh, using light when you use x rays it is xrf xrd and xps when electrons are involved then you have your sem tem which is used for microscopy analysis when you use ions as a source then it comes to sims ISs, NBS, that is what backscattering, all these come under this category. So now let me take you from this field of chemistry to an interesting field that is called as uh, biomaterials, uh, which means uh, what you need to do is what is going to affect you and me, so that we always need to be worried about. Whether you have a cut in your finger, whether blood bleeds or it stops, you need to take care because you don't want an infection to get through. So what? So what should simply heal, you should not make it into a big problem, big infection and land up in a big operation. So that is where these things come in. And so when you talk about healthcare, the first example that comes out over here is biocompatibility. So what is this biocompatibility? This biocompatibility means acceptance of a material or any artificial material inside your human body. So what are the reactions you expect? Always you expect irritation, you expect an inflammatory response, allergic reaction, and you don't want any toxic ions to come so that that will cause any side effects or cancer. Now, why do you need to evaluate this property? So that is our first question. So normally what happens when a mosquito bites you? You just start itching. So itching starts and that page you, uh, and that, at that spot you try to start your scratching. So when a small mosquito bite or ant bites, your body is reacting. So how do you think when you take a big implant like this and put it into your body, your body is going to simply accept it? Definitely not. So even if dust falls into your eyes, what happens? Tears start coming out and you start crying. So which means dust is a foreign material. Your body doesn't want it inside, so it is able to throw it out. So at the same time, even you may like to eat whatever you want, but when your stomach decides it is not good for your body, immediately you start vomiting and everything is thrown out. So that is why biocompatibility plays a very, very important role. And uh, this uh, question of the Williams definition of biocompatibility, it is the ability of a material to perform with an appropriate host response in a specific application. So this was how the definition was coined in the year 1999. So this field is basically a new field and uh, he is the person, Professor Bonfield, who did a uh, uh, no, he's Professor Williams who did coin this uh, uh, definition of uh, biocompatibility and uh, he's also the editor of the biomaterials uh, journal. So therefore, when you try to look at what I've been telling you is we have been talking about a biomaterial, biocompatibility and uh, where this material is implanted, that is what is called as a host. The host is nothing but the human body. So the response of the host uh, has to be evaluated. So a biomaterial is any substance other than drugs. So your drugs don't come under this category. So they can be synthetic or natural in origin, and that can be used to replace any tissue, organ, or uh, retain the function of the human body. So implants are basically classified into two types. One is called as a prosthesis, and the other one is called as a fixation device. So what is a fixation device? A fixation device is nothing but a temporary support structure so if you have a small fracture, you make use of an implant. So that stays in your body for a specific period of time. And once the healing process is established or new bone is formed, then you are supposed to remove it back. So that is what is called as a temporary support structure. Whereas prosthesis, suppose you have an accident, you meet, meet with an accident and your hip bone is destroyed or it gets broken. So then you have no other choice, but you have to replace the entire hip. So all those organs, which are all those uh, uh, joints, which have been totally replaced, so that you cannot again expect new bone to grow. So that you want to have a good stability. So that is what is called as a prosthesis. So until the patient dies, this uh, implant will remain inside his human body. So the materials used for manufacture of this orthopedic and dental applications is uh, you have seen uh, 
the use of pure metals that is quite commonly was gold so it was uh, hardly 20 30 years ago you find people uh, if their tooth falls or tooth has been decayed they will all have a gold uh, fixing and gold coating because at that time gold was cheaper and affordable not the cost as today which is around uh, 4300 or 500 rupees per gram so but the only problem with gold was gold has poor mechanical properties you'll be able to bend and change its shape with your hand itself so that is why gold was uh, not preferred so from that they went to alloys like uh, stainless steel which uh, whose number is 316 lss and similarly you have titanium and its alloys you also have ceramics that play a big role that is bioactive as well as glass ceramics so this is another uh, place where you're going to see you have the metallic biomaterials that can be placed in your shoulders in your hips in your knees so any place you want you'll be able to use it so this is also a typical knee implant that comes over here so you fit in one side here and one side over here and then you have the bending motion so this is for your uh, 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 limbs on the other side over here the spinal cord so here you make use of uh, this kind of uh, implants with uh, screws so it's a typical uh, hip implant where you have the hip joint so this is made out of metal as well as a ceramic and also polymers so all three mixed together they make this uh, implant and uh, this is the ones which you use for dental and uh, this is all the temporary uh, support structures will look like so this is used just like you use for your mechanical problems you want to fix something you make use of the screws and you make use of the nuts so this is how you carry out and do the operation so similarly this is how it is faced and this is what is called as a stent which has been in the news for the past uh, two years so that is because the government of india has capped the uh, has capped the rate of the stent so that is what uh, has uh, happened so now these stents are available from 25000 onwards now i'll show you this uh, video where you'll be able to see how uh, the plaque that is formed in the heart arteries so you always hear people coming up with a block so block happens because uh, the calcium uh, present in the body reacts over here with the acid so it forms calcium oxalate and all those goes and deposits over here and it forms a big block so the flow of blood is being affected so now let's look at uh, new devices which are available that will help you to clean this area and then this tent will be fixed over here So this is the area that has to be cleaned. So this is another area where you see the entire block is there. You have it like a small drilling machine, drilling bit. So it just comes and drills it. So using the mechanical force, it is trying to dissolve it, but that's not happening. So it just comes and pulls and takes it out. So here it just comes like a pen goes inside and then does all the drilling. So once it's able to clean and clear the block, the entire vehicle will be withdrawn. So here you look just like a band, you have it over here. So this goes inside, pushes it, and thereby makes the area clean. So this is another one where they use the polymeric uh, threads, so uh, which is also has the wires present in it. So that goes and tacks to the block, and then it just tries to remove it out. So this is another case where you have the blood clots that are present. So you have like needles. So this needle comes out and tries to clean it. So this is another type where you just send it out. It then opens out, comes like a mask, take it and remove it. So this is like a beautiful cage they bring over here. Catch hold of the clot and remove the clot. So this is nothing but nanotechnology. So this is your plaque. You bring in all the nanomaterials release it over there and that cleans the entire surface and then that's how the block is being removed. So after the block is removed, these tent materials will be uh, fixed into, uh, fixed at the site of the operation. So if you look at the clinical uh, use of uh, orga inorganic biomaterials, so you have two sides, one you have bioceramics, on the other side you have metals. So starting from your head to the toe, you'll find that everywhere uh, materials can be used. So metals will be used over here for cranial plates to the implants over here. And similarly, bioceramics is used for your, uh, again, for your cranial repairs uh, that is in the head to maxillofacial restoration. 
that is all the damages that occur to your face when an accident takes place so everything will be uh, uh, will be or can be carried out using uh, bio materials so now you i have given you an introduction about what is a bio material uh, what is its need and what is its requirements so when you look at the requirement you i told you first its compatibility that is biological compatibility so which means there should be no tissue reactions and no degradation should occur so these are all the tests which you have to do next is the biggest problem that is your mechanical properties why mechanical properties is see, when you have a fracture your bone has broken the bone has broken because it is having poor mechanical strength so now you don't want to put an implant so that your implant will also break and your bone will also break so that is why you want to have something which is very very stronger so therefore you have to test all the elasticity to yield strength to ultimate strength all these properties have to be evaluated so once your mechanical properties are evaluated next we go to the manufacturing in case of manufacturing simply to do anything that is you want to uh, make manufacture a bureau or you want to manufacture a window so all that or, or your uh, house gate so all that you make use of mild steel you give it to a welder that fellow will weld and give you whatever design you want but welding is not accepted over here for implants because that will lead to corrosion and failure of the implants so here what we try to do is we use the fabrication methodology the consistency of the information is uh, very much look, uh, required and then you have the quality of raw materials which also you have to look into and then the characterization and cost of the specific products so these are all the factors which are involved in manufacturing now does this uh, field really provide an employment for you or is it uh, worth to pursue this field so that's again a billion dollar question because uh, metallic implants are on 40% of the annual 3.6 million orthopedic operations metallic implants are being used and another thing is is a 6 billion dollar market and five out of every 100 americans carry a piece of metal in them so this is just because of the lifestyle of the americans they are very aggressive people and actively involved in sports and uh, so therefore they meet with, meet up with lot of accidents so that is why they have a piece of metal in them so what is our uh, aim over here is we look at metallic implant materials we try to reduce the uh, fracture replace the hip knee and also try to do oral and maxillofacial uh, surgery that is oral is for the mouth and maxillofacial is for the uh, face and other components so what we may basically make use of here basically we make use of here is metals so why we prefer metals metals we prefer is just because of the strength the strength of the metals is much more uh, uh, important as i told you the metals have to be strong one they have very good surface properties because of the formation of the native oxide and uh, next one is the chemical modification of the surface that can also be done and when it comes to corrosion it is very much resistant to corrosion and therefore it can be used as an implant so therefore metals are uh, uh, they are always get oxidized uh, oxidize on the surface so they form metal oxides which are not harmful to the human body but they are very much useful and among these metals titanium offers better corrosion resistance and that is what is widely used as an implant material so therefore when you look at the orthopedic materials you have the different implant designs and you have to do Uh, you cannot just directly take and sell them so this has to be converted you given a coating and those coatings are the ones which are being uh, developed for being for various applications now when you try to look at the uh, organization of your bone so here you have the same uh, trabecula and then uh, this is the typical bone where you have the this is called as a cortical layer and this is called as a cancellous layer that is a soft bone so when you try to use your microscopy and see what all it has so this is how it comes and then finally you have the collagen bundles so the collagen fiber present in your body so that combines with the fibers and that is what is given over here so apatite mineral crystals of uh, 200 to 400 armstrong long are present in your human body so that is why the calcium which you take in your food so that is what helps this bone to grow and these are the reactions which are involved So now let me show you some case studies and uh, how uh, implants are all useful in the human body. So here is uh, one thing where you have the osteoporosis, and uh, if you look at it, this is a normal bone which it should, it should be. There should not be any gaps in between. But here, if you look at the one affected by osteoporosis, this bones become very very thin and very very 
fragile. So end of the day, what will happen is if you take a chalk piece and try to break it, so that is what it will break down into. So now what we are trying to do is we are trying to take the human femur, uh, the vertebra, that is your bone, and your uh, uh, bovine tiba and all these things. And on this, you try to make use of, uh, do all your uh, um, finite element analysis using your mechanical engineering expertise. And then you try to create a 3D uh, uh, image. And this 3D image, you try to print using your uh, synthetic methods. So now, uh, what are the requirements for biomaterials? So for a material to be active as a biomaterial, you need to look into its mechanics, its materials, its biological, environmental, surface, as well as chemical. So after all, it is an implant, but it has to undergo all the studies. Unless it is able to pass through all these things, then only it can be used for an implant application. So then you uh, take care that your vaccine also does the same purpose. And that's why testing is uh, very, very important when it comes to biomaterials. So the keywords here is these uh, materials are classified as uh, metallic, glass, polymers, uh, fracture, fatigue, tissue response, uh, hard and soft tissue implants. So you have a lot of classification. So basically for any part of your body, we try to recreate and uh, give them back to you. So the uh, material selection parameters include right from mechanical to thermal to diffusion to water absorption, biostability and biocompatibility. Unless we are able to evaluate all these things, then uh, we will not be able to recommend that material for manufacturing and for use in the human body. So therefore, we always look at the structure from which we try to uh, get the soft tissue replacements. From that, you move to functional tissue uh, engineering constraints. So this is another example is your intraocular uh, lens. So you have heard about people uh, doing cataract uh, surgery. So when cataract surgery is done, these days, no, uh, earlier, if you look at 10, 15 years ago, people used to wear very thick glasses. But today, nobody wears any thick glasses. They just wear their reading glasses. So this is because of this uh, technology of this lens, So which is called as uh, PMMA. So which uh, polymethyl acrylate is what it is made up of. And these are the two strings with which it is able to sit inside the eyes. And this is another vascular graph. So vascular is the region uh, right from your uh, stomach onwards. So if you look at it uh, to the extremity organs, so if there is any uh, problems or you need an implant, so that is made out of uh, polymers along with a wire mesh inside. So this is a typical heart valve which is being used, which is also called as a Sichitra heart valve. Uh, which was indigenously built in India. And uh, this is a typical heart valve. You just have like a 50 paisa coin over here. So when it just uh, falls like this, then no blood will flow. When it just opens up, all the blood will flow over here. So the same way you have the uh, uh, tricupsid wall, and this is the biological valve, which is made out of porcelain. That is nothing but from a, uh, a taken from a pork. So taken from... A, Harvested from uh, pigs is what is being used as the heart valve. That resembles to that of the human uh, uh, human beings. So that is why it is most uh, welcome over here. And similarly, you have all your cardiovascular devices, the stents which you saw, uh, saw already in the video. So that is what is given over here. I'm just waiting for a slide to move. There's a bandwidth issue. Yeah. Yes. And now when you look at uh, the synthetic polymer scaffolds, so this is just to have uh, recreate your bone, which is uh, porous in size. So here we have the polymers and bi bioceramics. We mix both of them and try to uh, do some sintering in the oven and then we try to get this uh, implant which is used for uh, uh, to have cells grown over here so this can be used for uh, nose reconstruction also 
So this is typically where if you look at a scanning electron microscope with a one millimeter resolution. So this is in a typical osteoporotic bone where you have so much of uh, gaps which are uh, present. So which indicates that this bone is already uh, lost half of its uh, life. And therefore, uh, in order to protect it, you need to have an implant. And that implant should automatically look like this. So that when you do a cell culturing over here, the cells will grow and uh, sit over here. And later on, it will give you the uh, new uh, help in new bone formation. So when you talk about orthopedic implants, orthopedic implants are uh, basically classified uh, based on the load. So this is the one that is used for uh, hip. So this is for your uh, knees. So this is for your uh, spinal cord and this is how it looks like over here. So the most complicated one is a spinal cord because the nerve system is involved and you need to take care that you will never touch the nerves. Similarly, in case of dental, cosmetics is very, very uh, important. So therefore, uh, uh, you always have to have a metal over here because the forces, whatever you give and chew and eat, all your uh, nuts and dry fruits and all these things, so that forces also it should withstand. So that is why it is given in the uh, bottom. It is made out of metal. So similarly, now if you take a look at the normal hip versus the arthritic hip. So if you look at it, this has been totally denatured over here. And here you look, there is no big gap between both of them. And this hip is totally going to break into two pieces. And uh, looking at all these uh, metals and metallic implants, they are all affected by a phenomena called as corrosion. Corrosion is nothing but degradation of metals to oxide, uh, uh, oxide, hydroxide or other compounds through chemical reactions. So why is it made more corrosive is because of the presence of uh, water, dissolved oxygen, proteins, chlorides, hydroxy, uh, hydroxide. All these things complicate the uh, corrosion process. So how does this corrosion occur? This corrosion occurs that is called as, it has different forms of corrosion. One is called as a crevice corrosion where you have the nuts and bolts. So inside this, the chloride travels over here, reacts with the metal to form metal chloride. And that is how it is lost. And similarly over here, you have a uh, pitting corrosion, which will always travel in this direction. So therefore, since uh, uh, these uh, reactions take place, it just tries to eat away. So similarly, the intergranular corrosion over here. So I'll just try to explain to you in this figure how intergranular corrosion occurs. So this intergrain boundaries you're already familiar with right from your school days, where you have the BCC structure, HCP structure, that's your body center cube, face center cube. Now on a metal, you want to find out what it is. So if you take stainless steel, uh, the main compound that is present over here is carbon. Carbon will be present only along the sides. It is not present in the middle. So when chromium, which is present already in stainless steel, and uh, when you do a carburizing process, you treat it with carbon, so then what happens is uh, chromium will form, uh, uh, react with this carbon to form chromium carbide. So now what happens is Cr23C6 is being formed. So once when the concentration of chromium drops to less than 9%, then this leads to corrosion. So normally when you see with your naked eye, you'll not be able to find out. But this is taken with an optical microscope of 15 micrometers. And here we are able to see all these uh, flakes that have been followed and that is how we keep uh, doing this analysis so now as i told you earlier you had shown about uh, loosening and uh, breaking of this so if you look at it this implant is already uh, there's a loosening portion there's so much of gap between the bone and the implant and uh, the cup is also loosened over here so if you look at it what happens is this cup has penetrated uh, penetrated here inside and this is how it is able to break the uh, polymeric part so these type of dangers also occur with implants. And here you see the degradation. It just breaks off into pieces. Now when it breaks off into pieces, all this plastic material or the polymer material that is coming out over here. So this will enter the bloodstream and this will be circulated in your body. So this has to be avoided. So therefore, for uh, synthetic biomaterials, is nothing but a combination of metals, ceramics, uh, polymers, composites, and uh, semiconductor materials now let's look into the what nanotechnology has to offer for you and what are the nanotechnological uh, solutions which we are going to look at so basically nanotechnology is nothing but understanding the control of matter at dimensions roughly 1 to 100 nanometers so when it's 1 to 100 nanometers we want to measure the earth yes it is several billion parts so what we try to do over here is 
we try to prepare nanomaterials and then try to characterize them so that we make use of these properties for the well-being of ourselves. So what is nanotechnology? Nano comes from the Greek word that means a dwarf, manipulation of matter less than 100 nanometers, and then the size of uh, a, ba a bacterium, and as well as uh, human hair, which is around 75 micrometers, is the diameter of it, and this is also a collection of nanomaterials. So evolution of uh, uh, revolution began 47 years ago, uh, and then still continuing. So billions of nanometers make up a person. When you take his finger alone, it comes to a million nanometers. So from this, you take a drop of blood, it comes to thousands uh, 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 of nanometers. And then from there, you have the uh, nanometric structure and less than a nanometer is also possible. So therefore, if you look at uh, things which we can do naturally, so here you have... Uh, uh, here you have the DNA structures, all the biological materials on this side, and you have the inorganic materials on this side. So all of them are made with uh, nanotechnology and with uh, nanomaterials. So side by side, this can also be done. So therefore, for evolution of nanotechnology, the problem is, as of now, it is in its innocent strength. And we hope that uh, in the 21st century, it will start to pick up. But because of the corona and COVID pandemic, there has been a delay in this growth of technology. But to the mass market, we hope it will be able to realize and uh, it will be used in the next five to 10 years. And therefore, uh, we'll be able to uh, get into mass production. The devices will be much, much uh, cheaper. So now let's uh, I'll give you an example how nanoparticle can be used for drug delivery. So doxyrubinson is a simple uh, most antibiotic drug that can be used. So one out of uh, four deaths in the United States is from a cancer patient. And uh, this is what the data they have uh, presented. So now we just take a look at this uh, video and see how uh, nanotechnology can be used for uh, fighting cancer. So you have your breast cancer, you have the breast cancer mark. So marker that is around, uh, that is a CA13. And here you have the cancer marker that is CA27 to 29. which is the breast cancer. So now this is the drug. So this is your chemistry. So this is the drug that you are going to use for fighting the cancer. So now this is the robot which you have uh, designed. So it just looks like a walnut for you. So inside this you have your, uh, you have to place your uh, uh, drug molecules and then you will attach it to immunological and other uh, bone factors. And that is how it is being fully covered. So this is a typical tumor area where you have the tumor cells which have been uh, developed and grown in your body. So now you have to remove them. So instead of doing a surgery or doing anything else, we try to take these nano robots and these robots are released into the bloodstream. So this goes and stays in between those cells. And now you just look at your uh, imaging as well as others will follow up with what is happening. So you have the dox particles. So these are the robots. See, it is entering into your cells. So like uh, rockets, it's all going inside. So now what it will do? It has a biomarker on its uh, surface. So therefore, this has to be attracted by the biological stuff. So these markers which are present over here. So this will be attracted by the host uh, response. That is your, when it is circulated inside the blood. And uh, because of the response over here, it will try to break up. And as it breaks up, all the cases move out and you have the drug which is being released. So dox is delivered successfully and just like a bomb blast, it will just clean and clear that area specifically for you. So this is how the bomb blast takes place and all the tumor cells are broken. And this is the future and we hope uh, we will see it as a device. And if you look at this video has come in 2013 and we are in 2021, we are just looking forward for uh, uh, nanotechnology to give us this assistance. Uh, but just to share with you that uh, as far as medical field is concerned, you may invent something today, but it cannot be used tomorrow because it has to undergo all the trial and testing. As you saw in the case of Corona vaccine itself, 
it took so much time for approval. They have used all shortcuts and reduced the time and uh, field study rates because it is always prevention is better than cure. So that is what we are trying to look at. So this is another nano addition mechanism, which has been a, a nanotechnology based product. So this is nothing but Geeko, which is a lizard, which all of you have uh, uh, seen, and then you have an idea as to uh, how it is. So the main advantage of this uh, Geeko is, or a lizard, on the ceiling, it can just walk upside down without falling. But whereas if you go and uh, even fit a fan and st start looking upwards, your head will start to uh, rotate and you will feel that you are getting giddiness. So that is what has happened. So this Geeko food structure, when we try to analyze it using a microscope, they found that uh, you see the small, small layers of sticky rows which are available. So this is what is called as the lamellae. So it just looks like uh, small sheets of paper which is being arranged. And you just look at this thing. It comes in the form of uh, brushes. And this is how it can be isolated. And this is the tip. So this is the tip that holds on to the surface. And that it creates a vacuum. And when the vacuum is created, it tries to open up uh, everything. And that is how we are able to try to create a device. So Spider-Man, Batman was all seen in films. So it is not uh, anybody's uh, uh, katpane, as you call it as. But it is not only a, a dream. It is reality. It is possible. So that is why with this dress, they'll be able to hold on top and even walk uh, using their own hands. So this has been uh, public published. And uh, you can also have the micro uh, fabricated adhesives which mimic it. And when you look at the robotic device, so this is a typical device. You use this. So for cleaning all your uh, walls and all these things, you can make use of this robot, which will do its work much perfectly. The next topic I'm going to introduce to you is bioceramics. As you know, all your bone is made up of calcium and phosphate. So this calcium phosphate is nothing but it is a bioceramic. The main advantage over here is it is strong, stiff, and biocompatible. So that is not an issue. Good wear characteristics and good properties. So everything is good over here except uh, when it comes to the strength. So you also have it as two types. One is the bioinert and bioactive. Bioinert means it will just, uh, uh, when you use it as a filler, it will remain in that place. Whereas bioactive means new bone should be formed. So this is the properties about uh, hydroxyapatite. It has got a lot of advantages and disadvantages. And of course, uh, since it is as poor mechanical properties, uh, just as a scale, it is not able to uh, give. So therefore, what you try to do is you try to uh, try to grow new bone over here. So if you look at these, is the osteoblast and osteoclast, and this is the fractured areas where you have the gaps which are present. So once when you take this hydroxyapatite and implant in the human body, you will find the new bone formation taking place. Like uh, here you have the T cells, the R cells, and all of them. And all of them will convey to this that uh, the gaps found over here should be filled. So, so therefore, uh, when you look at it, uh, this process of bone resorption and uh, new bone formation both take place. And ultimately, what we want to do is we want to take an implant, give it a coating over here so that the calcium and phosphate and collagen, which is present in your human body, that will come and attract to this form new bone and the process of amorphous bone formation. And finally, after three months of keeping an implant, you take an X-ray. You don't find any gap between the uh, bone and the tissue. So they both will look alike and your new bone would have uh, grown over there. So we use a technique which is called as the electrochemical uh, deposition. Uh, so it just involves applying a potential. And with the applying potential, we have created this uh, nanotechnological uh, coatings. So here, what we are trying to do is it's a hydroxyapatite coating on titanium alloys. So it's basically titanium metal on which uh, it's a nanotechnology coating. But when you just look at this with your eyes, you don't find it. So what we do is we use a scanning electron microscope to analyze it. So one, uh, one meter or resolution is what we have given over here. So you just look at this, and then you take it as 10 micrometers. And then you find this particles as good, uh, beautiful flowers and rod shaped ones. So using atomic force microscopy, we would like to do the imaging for this. And that imaging, you are able to find that the same type of rod structures are there. And this is the porosity which can be seen. So similarly, you see the pores over here, even in this uh, structure. But as all of you have studied already in school about uh, mm, uh, body-centered cube, face-centered cube and all. So here, this is an hexagonal closed pack system. 
So here, if you look at this, is nothing but a typical uh, body-centered cube. So therefore, you have the uh, body over here, so which is in the form of a crystal, and this crystal is what is being arranged so that you get a good new bone. So that is what the coating was all about, uh, which you saw over there, which is a typical nanotechnological coating. So similarly, you also have biodegradable polymers and hydroxyapatite. So you can choose a polymer and a ceramic and also mix both of them. You'll be able to get a lot of products. So one such product we are trying to look at is we are for use in dentistry. So we would like to make it out of uh, this polymer. And then you, you make use of the screws like this so that once the operation is done, the patient need not come back to the surgeon again. So you can do your own routine duties. And this will slowly dissolve over a period of time. So that will be from three months to six months, it will dissolve. So this is again to tell you about a tissue engineering bladder. So the urinary bladder is being uh, synthesized in the lab. And uh, this is how it was uh, being done. But uh, this was reported in the year uh, 2006. But uh, again, another 14 years down the lane, we are still not been able to see this uh, artificial tissue uh, engineered bladder in the market. So the test and trials are still going on and on. So now imagine a world where transplant patients do not wait for the donor. So they want to come and start. You have to give an organ. So what do you do for that? So for that, what we have to do is we have to go only for 3D printing. So this video will show you how a 3D printing is uh, basically done. So here they have done is there is a uh, National Bank of uh, a national bone bank where they have given uh, uh, these things. So let's look at uh, the science behind this in uh, 60 seconds. Uh, so what's happening is uh, this tissue engineering, which is called as the regenerative medicine. So what we try to do is we try to take the cells from the human beings, and that has been grown on the on a scaffold itself so that the disease part can be replaced. For example, in COVID, all of the lungs were uh, damaged because of the pneumonia. So you want to reconstruct it? Yes. You take a polymeric uh, membrane like this and then you add some good growth factors and, and then you give them the correct forces so that you allow the cells to be grown. So the cells will be taken from your own human body and from that it will all be taken grown and once you have grown them so that will be delivered to you because all the hospitals are ready to do the procedures but then they just want uh, you to be ready over there and with that those implants can be developed so this is another typical video to show how a uh, uh, 3d printing is uh, done so this again uh, artificial hardware which i showed you so that is what is being uh, developed over here. And uh, this type of valves can also be uh, printed. So here again, I show you how a cartilage uh, 3D printing is done. So you give the design using it, the mechanical engineers will develop this hydrogel and that can be used to repair your knees. So this is the portion that was being damaged uh, because of all your walking and walking habits. So therefore the 3D printed material can be customized uh, to fit each other so the materials is used for uh, knee implants so because this cartilage is a very soft material and if this is uh, getting wear and tear is happening then it will cause pain and then it will start damaging your bone so therefore we make use of this hydrogel material uh, which is just flowing like water and that you develop the hydrogel and then you try to replace it over here in the knees so that is how uh, it is being done. And of course, we hope in future uh, this will all be a reality. And uh, this is the work that's been carried out at uh, Duke University. Now, this is another concept of which is called as the uh, bioglass. So this was developed by Professor Larry Hench uh, from the Imperial Laboratories. And I had the opportunity to interact with him. So beautiful materials being developed that will be used to uh, regenerate the forehead and uh, various applications are available with bioglass. So this is a case where this face, uh, child's face has a deformity. So this is a virtually uh, virtual reality assisted surgery of the Mayo Clinic. 
So here what they are trying to do is using 3D printing, we try to get this figure measurement and then print the structure and then reconstruct it so that what was disfigured is totally changed over here and a new face is being generated at the end of the day. So it will happen like this. So before we conclude, biometry is an emerging industry. So the next generation of medical uh, implants and therapeutic modalities are here. And it is an interface between biotechnology and traditional engineering. And also significant industrial growth is going to take place in the next 15 years. And of course, it's a very potential billion dollar industry. So before we conclude, so this is one of the modern uh, uh, techniques that has come up. So this is a cut or scar that has happened. So you need not go to a doctor have stitches and all this. So just take, uh, take a gum and put it over here and that is going to seal. So this is from the research work from the University of Sydney. So this glue is going to help you to heal quickly and the entire drying process is going to take only 60 seconds. So in less than a minute, you see how the skin changes. And can you tell me where the wound was? Not at all. So a joint project between uh, United States and uh, University of Sydney. So they have uh, developed this surgical glue. Its commercial name, uh, Metro, is yet to see the market. So this is how it was being done. So a hydrogel-based uh, concept. So without needing any stitches or any staplers, it can be cured. So just pour the gel-like uh, material Activated with UV light, polymerization will take place and you have the entire scar that is getting disappeared. So what you have to wait for uh, one week or 10 days for the scar to dry and remove. So this can happen in just a minute. So future is we are looking for the heart and lungs also to come up with these mechanisms so that they can be successfully uh, tested. As of now, it has been successful in uh, rodents that is in the rats and slowly we hope one day it will also come to the humans and we will be able to help mankind. So with this I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your uh, patient listening. So what you see over here is uh, today this person has an amputated hand. So he's using a artificial hand. He's able to go for trekking. So normal persons itself will not be able to hold a egg with your two fingers. But here you look at a device that will be able to, a robot that will be able to hold an egg very perfectly than you can hold. This will be the future of the operation theater where you'll just have the uh, table over here followed by all devices and gadgets and all operations will be carried out over here. Thank you. Now the session is open for questions. Sir, it's really an amazing speech. Uh a wonderful insight of biomaterials. Uh, thank you so much, sir, the video presentation, everything. I think it uh, it has really impressed the students and uh, uh, students would uh, definitely pursue their uh, research or career in biomaterials. So, so such was your uh, uh, success of this presentation. Uh, it's really amazing and scintillating presentation, sir. Uh, regarding the question and answers, just one question, sir. Uh, how to check the biocompatibility of biomaterials? It's always yeah, a challenging uh, one. Yeah, it is a challenging one. It is just not uh, one test or two tests you have to do. You have to do a systematic test, uh, one in the labs, and then you move from the once it passes through all the lab tests, then you take it to the cell culture level. After cell culture level, you look at uh, small animals from uh, rats to rabbits, and then it goes to humans. So it's a big, long uh, procedure that is being uh, used for this uh, purpose. Generally, can we say how long the duration will be set from uh, clinical trials to the in vivo or uh, the implementation of it from five the invention? Years. Minimum five oh. years. Okay. Uh, I think there are no more questions. Just one question was there. Thank you so much, sir. As um, a token of appreciation, uh, we would uh, like to thank you with uh, an appreciation letter from our university. Um, may I request you to share it? So this is our appreciation letter from our university to you, sir. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. For your wonderful presentation. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. We will send you this letter through email shortly, sir. Thank, thank you, you for being with us and made this day wonderful. Yeah. It's been really great. 
interacting with you and your uh, students and your department. So looking forward to interacting with uh, you people again and again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Time for word of thanks now. May I call upon Dr. R. Nitya, Assistant Professor of Chemistry Department, to give word of thanks. Good afternoon, all. I am Dr. R. Nitya, working as Assistant Professor in the Department of Chemistry. Take this opportunity. Take this opportunity to propose a word of thanks. Ma'am, could you check your audibility, ma'am? Your mic and audio, please. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Good afternoon, all. I am Dr. R. Nitya, working as assistant professor in the Department of... I take this opportunity to pro propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the organizing team. My heartfelt thanks to our founder, Chancellor, through A.C. Shanmugam, Honorable President, Engineer, ACS Arun Kumar, Vice Chancellor, Dr. S. Geeta Lakshmi, Provost, Dr. G. Gopalakrishnan, Registrar, and Joint Registrars, who encouraged and motivated us to organize this program. I also thank our Dean, Dr. S. Manivannan, Deputy Dean Academic, Dr. A.R. Arunachalam, and Deputy Dean Administration, Mr. K. Sendil Kumar, who always supported us for the success of our campus activities. I also thank Dean Chemistry, Dr. P. Udekala, and Head of the Department of Mystery, Dr. S. Valli Ammai, for their con continuous and encouragement and support. On behalf of our university, my special thanks to our today's speaker, Dr. T. M. Sridhar, Assistant Professor and Head in Charge, Department of Analytical Chemistry, University of Madras, Gindi, Univers Gindi Campus who delivered his presentation in a well-explained and interesting manner. Thank you, sir. I extend my sincere thanks to all the participants for spending your valuable time in, in listening to us. I would also like to thank my dear colleagues, Dr. L. Ramapriya, Mrs. M. Shashikala, who are in the studio for their very good coordination. I would like to thank Mr. Ganesh Babu, system administrator, for his technical support. Once again, I would like to thank all the participants for making this event a grand success. Thank you. Dear participants, I thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Rahar Nityo, for your uh, word of thanks. Dear participants, this is an announcement to you. E-certificates will be given to you uh, to only those who submit the fill-in feedback form on time. Each certificates will be dispatched after three days of completion of the event. The feedback form is active from now onwards and will be active only till 5 p.m. today. We all will meet again in an another event. To know about our upcoming events, subscribe to our channel, MGR Phase 2 Digital Library. To know about us, visit our website. We are also available on Facebook and Instagram at chemfhs ERA. Thank you all. Have a good day. Dr. NGR Educational and Research Institute, University, Motherwell, Chennai.